Good afternoon, gentlemen, and welcome to another unit review for Florida history. Today we're going to talk about Tampa and the Spanish-American War of 1898. Gentlemen, the photograph you see here is Vincent Martinez Ybor. And if you ever go to Ybor City, which is in Tampa, it is the equivalent of Little Havana in Miami. Some of the greatest cigar families imaginable came to Ybor City from Cuba back in the mid and 18th and 19th century, pardon me. And it's interesting because even though we know tobacco has had a long history in the United States, when it was introduced to Columbus by the Carib or the Arawak Indians, we're not sure which, tobacco in those days was actually inhaled through the nostrils. That's a tough way to smoke a cigar. But, you know, we know that from the Surgeon General's warnings that cigars and other types of tobacco and nicotine are, are not good for health, but in the 1900s, cigars were a hot item. It was a major industry. You know, in the Spanish, the colonial Spanish kind of missed out on the tobacco. It was the English that picked up the tobacco crop. But we'll save all that for another lecture. Now, gentlemen, the thing about Mr. Ybor here was that he was quite a visionary. And when he brought his tobacco rollers, which they called Buckeyes in those days, to Tampa, right? He also brought with him many of the ideas of a Cuba Libre. Forgive my Spanish. You know, there had been many revolutions in Cuba and they were desperately trying to break away from the Spanish, who they thought were oppressive. It did not give them equal representation. In fact, they gave them very limited freedoms compared to what they would find here in the United States. So when Tampa came online, right, they were famous for political ideas, tobacco, and they were also famous for food. As a matter of fact, I digress here because I love Cuban food. And quite frankly, you know, as a guy whose roots go back to Munster, Ireland, I don't know a lot about the difference between Cuban and Spanish food, but the people of Ybor City considered themselves to be the American home of chicken, yellow, and rice. And they are very, very famous for their guava pastries with the rich, rich cheese. Oh my gosh, if that doesn't make you hungry, nothing will. So, obviously I digress a little bit here, but I got to tell you, if you ever go to Tampa, you're in for a cultural treat. All right, let's continue with the review. All right. So, gentlemen, this is where the industry is going to find its political identity. These are highly trained cigar rollers. It is an art. It is not a science. And as a former cigar smoker myself, I can tell you that the famous families like Habit Tampa and the others in, in Tampa bring on that tradition that still lives today. Now, the thing about it is this, is that rolling cigars are a very tedious time. It's an act of love, it's an art form, but it can be tedious. You know, remember, this is not an air-conditioned place. This is where you're working hard all day long, and so what the cigar owners would do in the factories was that they would hire readers. And these readers were the source of entertainment. There was no Wi-Fi, no radio, right? And so this group became very well informed about world events because of the readers. This gentleman would get up there with newspapers from around the country and read in both Spanish and English and entertain the cigar rollers. Now men, contrary to popular belief, there were also women that could roll cigars with the best of the Buckeyes. Now, one of the most famous political entities to ever visit Tampa was Jose Marti. I think it's safe to say that he was the Abraham Lincoln of Cuba. And Jose Marti is highly respected because, you know, he died in the revolution. He paid the ultimate price. He was dedicated to freeing Cuba from Spain allowing Cuba to have its own identity, its own political direction. And he would often come to Tampa 
to talk to the Buckeyes, to the cigar rollers, and ask them if they would donate part of their hard-earned salary to buy weapons and supplies for the guerrilla activities against the country of Spain and the home island of Cuba. In fact, he was so effective, he was so effective that he literally was almost poisoned by Spanish special agents who came to Tampa to try to kill him. That's how effective Jose Marti was. Men, on a sidebar, um, you know, I used to be a cigar smoker. Don't do it. Uh, it led to heart disease for me. And quite frankly, smoking, nah, there's no future in it. But having said that, right, it's still a big part of Florida history. All right. Moving on here, going to the next slide. Now, you know, this was the age of jingoism and jingoism and what we call today fake news was the idea of sensational newspapers. A lot of newspapers owned by the Hearst family and Pulitzer would often try to influence American foreign policy by kind of, if you will, exaggerating events with a certain political flair. And in this particular case, these individuals thought would, would absolutely empower the United States to control the Caribbean and to control the Caribbean by intimidating Spain. But, you know, we had to find an excuse, and that excuse is going to be the USS May. But a lot of people in Florida were a little bit fearful. You know, we're only 90 miles from Cuba, from Key West, and it's very, very possible that the Spanish Navy could possibly shell attack coastal positions along Florida, and we were not prepared for that. We did not have the physical forts. We did not have enough of them. And you know what? And, you know, it was a real concern. But the people of Florida were not well versed on the naval powers of the world, and they did not realize, and understandably so, that the Spanish Navy and the Spaniards themselves were not in a position to carry out attacks like this. In fact, they had slipped from the glory of the 14th and 15th century to being what we consider to be a third-rate power. And they just didn't have the military wherewithal to attack Florida. But Florida is going to get dragged into this war, okay? And here's the thing. If this turns into an economic war and the United States acquires Cuba as a territory, you know, we're going to get some competition here because Florida mirrors Cuba. Citrus, tobacco, cigars, sugar comes a little bit later. And you know what? There was even the beginnings of a tourist industry in Florida. Yeah, there really was. So to kind of quell the very vocal anti-imperialist who believed the United States was becoming more and more, shall we say, a colonial power again, maybe even an imperial power, they passed the Teller Amendment. And the Teller Amendment said that we would not annex Cuba, we would not make it in territory, territory, we would not offer it statehood like we've tried several times in Puerto Rico, and that we would basically allow Cuba to control its own destiny. Well, later there's going to be the Platt Amendment, and the Platt Amendment's going to give the United States a little bit, shall we say, of a better of, a, of being an overseer of Cuban political affairs. Both these amendments, the Teller and the Platt Amendment, used to give Fidel Castro a lot of ammunition for anti-American rhetoric in his speeches. But we'll talk about that when we get up to uh, the Cuban Revolution, okay? All right. Going on to the next slide. Here is the USS Maine. Now, men, this was the reason. This was the reason... This was, for a bad analogy, the Pearl Harbor of the Spanish-American War, the 9-11, if you will. I know that's a pretty bad analogy. When USS Maine exploded in the Havana Harbor, <clears throat> killing about 66% of its crew, the newspapers had the ammunition they needed to chide the American people and the American government into war. 
a war against Spain, not only in Cuba, but in the Philippines too. Now, gentlemen, you may not know this, but in those old pre-dreadnoughts, you know, these old, I hate to use this word battleship because it's kind of a, that's not the proper tune, but these coastal warships, right? It wasn't like a car. It wasn't like you could turn on the engine, right, and just put it in drive and push in the clutch. No. It took a long time to get up steam. You had to burn coal to get steam. And steam drove the piston, and the piston drove the screw of the propeller. So when you're in Havana Harbor, in case there's an emergency and you got to get out of there real quick, what they would do is that they would always leave at least one of the burners on burn coal while they were inside the harbor so they could raise steam more quickly to get out of there if an emergency dictated so. Well, there is a theory that that boiler in a design flaw caused the perpetual heat to ignite the artillery shells or the gun shells which ruptured the ship in a terrible explosion. Now, men, we'll be arguing about this forever. You know what? And there's been some really good, interesting reports from the United States Navy and a lot of maritime historians who know this stuff a lot better than I do. But there was supposedly a very similar incident with USS Olympia. And USS Olympia was very similar to the USS Maine. Same class, sister ship. And she, too, suffered a catastrophic uh, problem with one of the boilers would be interesting one time to take a maritime uh, archaeology class, wouldn't it? But, you know, like I said, there's a lot of marine authorities out there. But the important part is this, that you get, to get this. You know, I'm talking theory here. This may have been an accident. This may not have been sabotaged by the Spanish. It may have not been sabotaged by the Cubans to blame it on the Spanish to get us involved in the war. But it didn't matter because it gave us the excuse to go forward. I mean, look at, look at R William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pauls here. Look at this. Remember the Maine. The hell with Spain. And we're going to go to war. Now, you know, it's interesting. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in Tampa, and sometimes, you know, some of the stuff you don't get in the history books are kind of interesting, too. Tampa had a reputation for having more, shall we say, of gentlemen's clubs, then they had churches. And it seemed like some of these clubs were all owned by one woman, a young woman who immigrated from Cuba, and literally took a lot of her money from this, shall we say, questionable industry, and she built churches and took care of single women and women that were down and out. So one of the greatest philanthropists of Tampa was on the wrong side of the law. And it's also interesting to me that they didn't run her out of town because of all the good deeds that she did. Uh, you know, sometimes social history can be a lot of fun too. But it's interesting to me is that, you know, a lot of states showed up and they were anxious to see some action. But the number one state in the Union that had the most representatives who voluntarily went to Cuba and some of them were very, very upset when they didn't get called up, were the Tennessee Volunteers. I know if you follow, follow college football, that's their nickname, the Tennessee Volunteers. And these Southern boys thought that this was going to be one great and grand adventure in Cuba. Right? And a lot of times, they were just a handful. They go down to uh, Last Chance Street in Tampa. You know, that's where all the bars were and that sort of thing. And they would just get all riled up and, you know, drink too much. And then they would brawl. And, and the military police didn't exist the way it does today. And then they go down to the dockyards of the wharfs and they'd pick fights. And it was, it was, I think Tampa was happy to have them there because it improved the economy. But I think Tampa was also happy to get rid of them because these guys were just a wild bunch, you know. And there's old Teddy Roosevelt in the middle of them. Okay. All right. Now. Interesting thing I always like to bring up in this lecture is the Buffalo Soldiers. Now, this is an interesting term, and I've heard different theories about Buffalo Soldiers. I heard that Buffalo Soldiers were actually named 
by the Plains Indians or Native Americans in the Great Plains Wars against the tribes in the 1870s. And they said that the hair of the African American resembled the buffalo. And in some sources, right, they said the Native Americans used to call the African Americans the black white man because they had never seen uh, African Americans before or just Africans. Now, a lot of people ask this term, is Buffalo Soldiers derogatory? And I could see where that would come up. But I think in this day and age, ever since, you know, like songwriters like Bob Marley and others, I think Buffalo Soldier is now a mark of pride and distinction and is not derogatory. They were very well represented, especially the 10th Cavalry at San Juan Hill. And they were considered to be some of the best fighters around. Tough, didn't complain, right? Could march all day long, could pull a bad commander out of a bad situation. And as a matter of fact, five of the members of the Buffalo Soldiers Brigades, especially the 10th Division, went on to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. They also served in the Philippines. So it's kind of interesting, right, that uh, you know a lot of times we overlook the, co the contributions of uh, American minorities, and it's always good when you come across a story like this. All right? Uh, the Buffalo Soldiers. I know there's a museum, and I forgot where it's at, but uh, one day if I ever get to retire, I'm going to spend the rest of my days looking at all these great museums around the United States, and that's going to be my hobby. All right. But it's funny. Look at this picture of Tampa. Henry Plant. Henry Flagler's rival. Henry Flagler was a hotel builder and a railroad magnate on the east coast of Florida. Henry Plant was a hotel builder and a railroad magnate on the west coast of Florida. In fact, you may not remember this, but Henry Plant actually tried to beat Henry Flagler to build a bridge and a railroad to Key West to take advantage of the opening of the Panama Canal. But that was not to be because the southwest part of Florida does not have the geological foundation necessary to support the weight of a railroad. Henry Flagler lucked out because that spine of coral right, and limestone is on the east coast of Florida and not the west. But let's move on, okay? Now, Florida is going to become, Tampa is going to become the headquarters for the Cuban invasion by the United States military. Why? Because Plant had already dredged out Tampa Bay into a deep water seaport. Mm -hmm. He had already owned several railroads. He bought a lot of railroads from Florida in disclosure because the Florida railroad system was in complete chaos after the Civil War. Uh huh. He also had built nine hotels. One of the hotels is going to be called the Tampa Bay Hotel, right? And let me tell you what, that hotel cost $3 million. It was, on, it was a six-acre building, holy shoot, and it was on 150 acres of the most pristine, beautiful land in Tampa. His hotel, that big hotel, was the first hotel in Florida to have electric lights and an elevator. And he always liked to build these hotels that look like something out of the Middle East. He loved that Moorish design, you know, that kind of that Islamic, uh, North Africa, Arabic influence, right? You know, you kind of see in places like uh, Cordoba, Spain, and, you know, Morocco. He loved that. So it was a shoe in What about Miami? Miami's a lot closer to Cuba than Tampa is. Yeah, but I know, but, but Miami, men, remember, Miami became a city in 1896, this is 1898. We don't have a deep water seaport yet. We're just a village. This is the obvious choice. So, men, they're going to have so many soldiers coming to Tampa that every single hotel, mostly owned by plant, will be occupied. All the soldiers who do not have rank will be putting up tents and living in the yard of the hotels or living wherever they could. And you know what? Plant had done a good job. He made a lot of money off the war. 
he wrote the War Department and he told them that we know we need to start fortifying coastal cities, that Spain could possibly launch an attack, and he had good lobbyists. He had a lot of friends in Washington, D.C., and so he really did his homework to try to supplicate the case that Tampa should be ready if war with Spain breaks out. And of course, that's exactly what they did. There's the new tropical uniforms worn by the American Army. At that time, we know that Teddy Roosevelt kind of went off the, the rails a little bit. He kind of designed his own uniform a little bit. You know, sometimes the U.S. Army kind of looked the other way. He kind of designed his own outfit for the Rough Riders, but that's part of social history we'll talk about later. And you know what? It's interesting because remember how the Floridians dressed against the Seminole Wars. So we're starting to learn, you know, we're starting to learn that camouflage is a necessary commodity and certainly get away from those wool suits if possible. Cotton is king, all right? There's a picture of Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, pretty good shape. You know, supposedly he was a boxer and liked to spar a lot. And supposedly, I've heard some stories that his vision in one of his eyes wasn't great because of boxing tournaments that he used to always get involved in. He loved fisticuffs. <clears throat> the Tampa Bay Hotel, right? Look at this, 25,000 troops jammed into Tampa. Men, we're not going to need that many men. When the Army figures out that we have too many troops in there, they're going to be soldiers that are going to be injured, literally fighting each other, trying to get on the ships to go to Cuba because they'd come all the way down for this war, and now they're going to be put in reserve, and they want to see action. They want to go. They weren't going to miss this. And there's Henry Plant, and you can see the Islamic Moorish, if you will, influence in the hotels. And my gosh, you know, Henry Flagler had the Casa Marina in Key West, and he had a lot of great hotels. But Plant, Plant was the West Side King, and Henry Flagler was the East Side King. Look at this fact right here, guys. The railroad trains full of supplies and men and horses and everything else were so backed up that the train coaches were all the way to Ocala from Tampa. This is, to use the term, is overkill. Considering how long the war was fought, it was a very short war. It was too much. Too many men. It certainly was. Okay. And look at the guest list. Look at the guest list at this famous uh, hotel, okay, if you will, the Tampa Bay Hotel. Look at this. You got Stephen Crane, the Red Badge of Courage. You probably read that in freshman year. You got Clara Barton, started the Red Cross, okay? You got uh, Teddy Roosevelt, his wife Edith stayed at the hotel. If I know correctly now, I'm pretty sure that hotel is part of the University of Tampa system now. I'll have to check that out later, okay? But remember what I told you guys, a lot of guys were disappointed because we had more troops than we possibly needed and they were left behind. So, they go off to war. Right? 16,000 troops, 35 ships sail for Cuba. A party was thrown. And of course, Henry Plant's going to rent out his own private steamships to aid the Americans from getting from Tampa to Cuba. Some of the soldiers that were stationed in Miami at that time, didn't have such a good go of it. Just in case the, Cu the uh, Spanish and the Cubans, pardon me, the Spanish tried to invade South Florida, there was a garrison down here. And that garrison, look at this quote, this is great. One of the American soldiers garrisoned here in South Florida said, if I owned both Miami and hell, I'd sell Miami and I'd go live in hell. My friends, I grew up without air conditioning. I didn't have air conditioning until 1992. And you have no idea what it's like to live in South Florida with jealousy windows and no air. You had to be a certain tough individual to live in Florida in the old days. All right, moving on. Now, remember this thing about... Oh, Europeans knew for many years. My apologies. Men, believe it or not, yellow fever was a big problem. Sometimes if you saw a ship flying the yellow flag, stay away. 
malaria. They weren't sure what it was. I remember being called yellow fever, yellow jack. There were stories that people turned yellow before they turned a, a darker color and died. It was a disease caused by mosquito bite. And if on the test I ask you, is this true? It is true. More soldiers died in Cuba from mosquito bites than died from Spanish bullets. Now, interesting enough though, men, I told you in earlier episodes that my family is Chicago Irish and that my family got to South Florida because of World War II. My father's two older brothers trained down here to be gunners on B-29 super fortresses, but the atomic bombs made their deployment unnecessary. They trained down here, they thought Florida was the greatest, no more than Chicago winters, they convinced my grandparents to move down, and they've been here, my family got here in 1948. Well, a lot of people that went to Florida came from other states. And when this short war was over, they liked Florida. Some of them stayed. They never went home. Some of them went home, gathered their families and grew their belongings and came back. In fact, we're going to see quite a bump in our population and in Tampa, too, that's going to go all the way up to and cause the 1920s real estate land boom. It started as a direct result of the Spanish-American War. And you might remember the land boom from other lectures. Okay. All right. Now, gentlemen, you cannot separate Cuban history from Florida history. For 500 years, we know that people have immigrated from Cuba to the United States. There was even stories before Juan Ponce Leon that there were trade routes between the Tequesta and possibly the Calusa with the Cubans and the Indians of the pre-Spanish period. And we know that a lot of Cubans had come to Florida, but they also settled in Louisiana and Texas, and that this has been an inseparable part of our culture. Okay, We know there have been many revolutions in Cuba. There was a 10-year ten, ten one in 1868 that was not successful. And when it failed, a lot of Cubans ended up in New York, New Orleans, and Key West. And Key West drew a lot of people in because of, there were cigars in Key West. And Key West's industry was very dependent upon Cuban tobacco. But Tampa's going to have probably, oh boy, don't tell the people of Key West that. And I'm born in Key West, you know that. But the Cuban community in Tampa is probably going to have the leg up on the cigar industry. Yes, tobacco was big business then, and it still is today. Look at the population growth in Tampa after the Spanish, after the revolutions, okay? From 720 residents in 1880 to over 5,000 in 1890. And the more violence in Cuba, the more the immigrants came. Gentlemen, that's not the only wave. Here's the uh, the Buckeyes outside one of the great cigar factories in Tampa, Ybor City. Gentlemen, the big one was in 1959 with the July 26th movement of Fidel Castro. His brother Raul, I think that's Herbo Matos, who later betrayed the revolution. They called it the July 26th revolution because that's when Fidel first tried to take over the country. I think in 53 and failed, he came back, was successful. And at that time, before the revolution, we had about 125,000 Cubans living in the United States. That number is going to drastically change over the next two decades. Over the next two decades, all the way up to the Marielle boat lift, we're going to see hundreds of thousands of immigrants from Cuba coming to the United States. We talked about the interesting fact that President Kennedy was a guest at Tampa a few days before his assassination in Dallas, and that both Fidel Castro and John F. Kennedy had a deep love for Cuban cigars. Deep love. And you know, Roosevelt, pardon me, Roosevelt, listen to me, Eisenhower started the embargo in 1959 when Fidel came to power, but Fidel did not really declare himself, in my mind, as being a communist until after the Bay of Pigs failure 
for the United States in April of 1961. So Eisenhower is going to start the embargo, but Kennedy's going to put some real teeth into it, and that's going to be a problem. Because if there's an embargo against Cuba, President Kennedy's not going to be able to get his esteemed cigars. I think he liked the Artur Arturo Fuentes. Okay? And so he's going to make sure that he gets at least 1,200 cigars <laughs> from sources that were not, were not going to be named before he put the embargo together. Yes, he did. All right. Well, actually, what happened was, uh, as you know, we went through the... Uh... Yeah, that's a great little video we had there. Okay. All right, gentlemen. So... Well, actually, what happened... Oh, I'm sorry about that. So, gentlemen, this is uh, the review for the test, and I hope it was helpful. If you have any problems or any questions, make sure you email me, and I'll be more than happy to help you out. Okay, this is Mr. O'Brien.